hello everyone. Um, I'll ask you guys to sort of wave me when I get to the 10 or 12 minute mark. Um, uh, so my name is Jonathan Dewar and I represent this organization. This is a national organization that works in the data space uh, on behalf of First Nations. And so I'm gonna tell that story uh, in the briefest way possible. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, first uh, the Mississaugas of the credit. Um, I'd love to spend all of my time up here just talking to you about what it means to do land acknowledgements in a place like Toronto. Uh, I have done that at a few places in Toronto. Um, we don't have time to do that. Uh, but I do ask you to think de deeply about it. So when you are in a position to uh, make remarks uh, and find yourself uh, uh, faced with the question of how you will address land acknowledgements, I'd ask you to think deeply about it. I think that's the commitment we can make. Uh, and so the commitment I make is uh, certainly coming from the First Nations space is to really want to be respectful, to be a respectful guest uh, in the lands that I'm in. And so I acknowledge the First Nation uh, that is in this territory. But I also acknowledge the peoples who have moved through this space, who considered these spaces traditional territories and have been displaced, including my ancestors, the Huron Wendat. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. The next thing I was struggling with was, uh, uh, you know, what do I say to an audience like this? And it's a very diverse audience, but you're focused in areas that are, uh, you know, that do overlap with the type of work that we're doing, um, but uh, you know, uh, also diverge from the work that we're doing. And so I knew coming into this space that I'd be asking you to take a bit of a left turn as I talk about what we're doing. And I thought that the way to do this was really to key in on something that uh, Nazma said. Um, and a couple of, uh, at least one of the other speakers used this uh, uh, phrase as well, and it's something I love. And it's this idea of moving at the speed of trust. And so, that's really, I think, how we can talk about uh, the work that we do, because trust is essential because of this. So why does an organization like First Nations Information Governance Center exist? Well, it's because there are legacies of mistrust. So it's not just research, but all information gathering and the use of information, particularly with regard to laws and policies that impact First Nations people, um, uh, but, but also beyond that, there is this legacy of misuse and mistrust. And so if you've heard of us as FNIGC, that's the acronym, uh, as the First Nations Information Governance Center, it's probably because you've heard of the acronym OCAP. And I see heads nodding. How about a, how about a show of hands? How many people are familiar with OCAP? Okay, so it's, a, it's maybe a little fewer than I expected, but if you've heard of it, it's probably because of that uh, acronym. And don't worry, I'm gonna come back to that. There are slides on, on that acronym. Um, but it's this history that explains why an organization like uh, the FNIGC exists. Oops. Um, and so what is that history? Well. In the mid to late 1990s, First Nations on reserve and First Nations living in northern communities were left out of three important population surveys by the government of Canada. And so for communities that face a dearth of information, this was a huge challenge. And I give immense credit to the leadership of the day, so that's the formal leadership of First Nations communities, but also the thought leadership of the day who took that challenge that was presented to them and looked to turn it into an opportunity. And the opportunity was to petition for the development of a by First Nations, for First Nations national uh, health survey. Now, we, we've come to know that as the First Nations regional health survey. So it's national in the sense that the 10 First Nations regions in Canada come together to do a national survey. Um, but as they were meeting that challenge and turning it into an opportunity and ultimately a success, which was a long-standing health survey, there was the need to think through the ethics of doing this work, even for First Nations people doing work for their own communities. There was a need to think through what it meant. And so that saw the development of a set of principles that we call the OCAP principles. The OCAP principles stand for ownership, control, access, and possession. And again, I'll come back to that in a second on a later slide. Um, that work started, it was a group of people working as a network across the country to develop 
uh, collectively and collaboratively a national survey and to govern it. And the original structure was uh, governance through a, a national steering committee or a management committee. Eventually, leadership via the mechanism of the chiefs and assembly established us as a standalone organization 10 years ago. So in about a month, we'll actually be celebrating our 10th anniversary. Um, and uh, it's a significant milestone. But much more importantly, of course, is the fact that this work is well over 20 years old. So I talk about the success of this national survey. I talk about the importance of those OCAP principles and the work we do around the OCAP principles. And I acknowledge the age of that work, you know, well over 20 years. So what you need to know is that moving at the speed of trust with First Nations means knowing this stuff. In order to gain trust, you have to understand where the bar has been set by First Nations and the degree to which we've seen, seen partners outside of First Nations contexts rise to meet those challenges of, of meeting or even exceeding the bar that we've set. So what does it mean to be in a trust relationship, to be in a respectful relationship with First Nations? Whether you're a government, whether you're an academic researcher, whether you work in the NGO space like I do, or you work in the private sector, well, it means knowing what First Nations have done and understanding some very complex issues or at least putting in the work to begin to understand those complex issues. And amongst those compl complex issues are notions of First Nations data sovereignty. So if you follow the news around Indigenous issues, more specifically First Nations issues, you have undoubtedly heard uh, the term sovereignty and used in the context of First Nations in particular, but also more broadly, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'm only speaking from the perspective of an organization that represents the interests of First Nations, and we use sovereignty very differently than Inuit and Métis. So with all due respect to Inuit and Métis, I'm not representing them, and we need to make space for them to talk about how they think about uh, sovereignty writ large, but also information sovereignty within a context of sovereignty. For First Nations, it's, in, it's within this context of the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Canada or with the Crown. So in the last two years, I've worked with the national board of this now standalone organization to develop a new vision and mission, and it's here behind me on the board. Um, and you'll see that the focus in our vision is very much that First Nations data sovereignty focus, but there's some very important terminology that we use in that. And that is to say that we envision that every First Nation will achieve data sovereignty in alignment with its distinct worldview. And what that means is, is though we choose to come together to work collectively, our decisions are meant to be driven by the worldview of distinct nations. So the Mi'kmaq in the East, you know, make decisions from a worldview that may be different, sometimes fundamentally different than the Cree who uh, are spread across six provinces in at least one territory, or the Tunaka who live in uh, the Rocky Mountains, right? Uh, or the folks who live on Vancouver Island. These are distinct nations with distinct worldviews and they will approach these issues from those perspectives. And then our mission of course is how do we carry out some big concept like First Nations status sovereignty? Well, we have a series of principles that we uphold when we do this work. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly through uh, this storytelling about the organization because it's all available online um, and uh, you can certainly get this uh, from us. Um, so we are very careful to ensure that we focus on communities and a nation-based approach. So nation-based should uh, speak to you, uh, given what we just discussed about this notion of nations with distinct worldviews. But what does it mean to be community-driven? Well, a community is a is where people live, right? And so for many First Nations, there are many communities that make up that nation, right? So many Cree communities throughout Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and into the Northwest Territories, even some in BC. Um, so it's communities and communities with a governance system over those communities that need to drive decision making, but we respect the worldview. Thank you. Um, so First Nations data sovereignty, I've already spoken a bit about this. If this has uh, caught your attention and you're interested in this, we have a number of pieces on our website that uh, uh, dig deeper into the notion of First Nations data sovereignty. 
There's also a broader and even international uh, element to this. You may have heard of indigenous data sovereignty. So many of us around the world come together to talk about what we've learned from our you know, unique national or unique regional contexts. We work very closely with uh, Maori scholars uh, and data sovereignty warriors, very closely with folks in Australia, very closely with uh, folks in the US as well. Um, so again, there's more information uh, on our website about that. Um, but it's important to understand that in Canada, First Nations have inherent rights, and then of course, rights that are protect, uh, protected under, under Canadian law. And there's an important distinction there, but again, in the interest of time, I'm going to go by it quickly. Um, if we were to give you the elevator pitch about what we do as a national organization, you can see it's the national survey piece that I talked about, now over 20 years old. We also do broader research to support um, uh, these topics like First Nations data sovereignty. And then importantly, we also do education and training. So very importantly, we do detailed education and training work with people around data sovereignty around information governance and information management from First Nations perspectives, and of course, OCAP. And so what is OCAP for those of you who are not as familiar with it? Well, it's an acronym that stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession. And it essentially, um, it is the tool that you will use if you uh, develop a relationship, a relationship based on trust, with a First Nation or a collective of First Nations. Now, the important distinction to understand between principles and the role that a national organization has in upholding principles and educating people or even training people around those principles is that that's at the level of principle. So what does it mean? What does ownership, control, access to, possession of information mean? Well, it means quite simply, you know, those, those dictionary definitions of those words apply. But what does it mean on the ground when you're working with a First Nation? Well, First Nations are what we call rights holders. And so it is a rights holding community that can determine, they can define and then determine how they implement ownership of their information, control of their information, what it means to access their information, what it means to have possession of their information. So it's an important, important distinction for you to understand. And that's part of the training approach that we take with people. Uh, okay, so I've, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to go very quickly past these slides. Ownership, okay. If information identifies a First Nation, a First Nations community, it should be owned by the community, by that rights-holding body. So in Canada, there's a, there's a need to understand the difference between an individual and his or her rights and how information can be held collectively. And so collective rights. This is something that First Nations have understood since time immemorial, and it is not reflected, certainly not well, I would argue not at all, in Canadian law. And so you can begin to imagine the incredible gap that now exists in terms of how we can work respectively with partners, particularly the federal government. Uh, control then, um, I think again, is a pretty straightforward concept at the level of principle. Access, again, a pretty uh, accessible, uh, accessible, no pun intended, uh, definition at the level of principle, and then of course, possession. Greater detail on our website and in the training approaches that we take. And speaking of training, if you are interested, there is an online course that we offer around the OCAP principles. There's a number of modules that take you through you know, why it is important to understand these things, what it means in specific contexts, how those contexts can change from community to community to community. And I'm just gonna end with this idea that, as I started, um, you know, we need to move at the speed of trust. It's a great line, and I'm glad people have been using it. And what does it mean, mean to move at the speed of trust with First Nations? Well, it means understanding the legacy of bad behavior and how you can be swept up into a stream that is that legacy without intending to be there um, and how you can continue to perpetuate harm um, by accident. So there is a need to be you know, self-aware and then to learn and where necessary to change the paradigms that you work within if they don't align with the para paradigms of the First Nation partner you're proposing to uh, work ideally with, 
perhaps four. And so I'll end there and say thank you, Miigwech, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you.